thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to first thank the organizers for uh, putting together this uh, very nice seminar and it's a great opportunity to speak today. So today I'd like to talk about a proof of the Erdős primitive set conjecture. So to begin, I'd like to start with a basic definition. We say that a set of positive integers greater than one is primitive if no member in the set divides another. Okay, so some easy examples to get us started. Consider first the set of consecutive integers, n plus one, n plus two, et cetera, up to two n in a dyadic interval. So this interval is primitive because any number in the set, say j, all of its multiples, 2j, 3j, 4j, et cetera, are all going to exceed 2n and therefore lie outside the interval. And hence, no two numbers in the interval will divide each other. Another example of a primitive set is the primes. So no prime divides another. And more generally, for any number k, the set of integers with exactly k prime factors counted with repetition also forms a primitive set. So we'll denote um, in the talk the set of primes by p, math cal p, and the, the product set of k almost primes, numbers with exactly k prime factors, by p to the k. And uh, indeed, the k almost primes are primitive because if a number has k prime factors, then all its divisors will have fewer than k prime factors. And so no two will divide each other. Another example of historical significance is the set of perfect numbers. So uh, we say a number is perfect if it equals the sum of its proper divisors. For example, six has proper divisors one, two, and three, and one plus two plus three equals six again. So this notion of perfect numbers go all, goes, dates all the way back to ancient Greece. And the Greeks uh, were fascinated by these numbers and they had classified all positive integers according to uh, being either perfect, deficient, or abundant, depending on whether uh, the sum of proper divisors of a number was equal to that number, was less than that number, or was above uh, exceeding that number, respectively. So it's a bit uh, less trivial to show that the set of perfect numbers forms a primitive set. And if anyone is interested after this talk, I can give a quick sketch of this uh, result. So as a kind of origin story for these uh, primitive sets, we really begin in the 1930s in which primitive sets were generalizing one special problem. So by a classical theorem of Davenport, the set of abundant numbers, which we've seen on the previous slide, the set of numbers whose sum of proper divisors exceeds that number, this, has a wet, this set of numbers has a well-defined natural density. And in fact, we know today this density is approximately a little less than a quarter. So if you sample, sample numbers at random on the number line, roughly a quarter of the time, you'll expect to get a number of the abundant. And this result of Davenport was originally proven using sophisticated analytic methods. However, in 1934, Erdős found an elementary proof of Davenport's theorem by using so-called primitive abundant numbers. And his elementary proof led him to introduce the fully abstract definition of primitive sets that we've seen on the first slide. And in characteristic fashion, this spurred Erdős to study them for their own sake. So this is, this story really begins in the 1930s, after which uh, it kind of took on a life of its own. So around this time in the 1930s, there have been uh, a number of interesting and sometimes unexpected results about primitive sets. For example, early on, many people, including Chawla, Davenport, and Erdős, all believed that any primitive set should have zero natural density. 
For example, the set of primes, we know by the prime number theorem, there are about uh, x over log x number of primes up to x. In particular, this density tends to zero as x goes to infinity. And people believed that this held more generally for all primitive sets. However, in 1934, Vesikovich constructed a counterexample of sets of primitive sets whose upper density became arbitrarily close to one half. And this came to a great surprise to the mathematical community at the time. But by contrast, in the case of lower density, Baron and Erda showed that any primitive set must have lower density zero. In other words, a primitive set may or may not have a well-defined natural density, so a limit may not exist, but you can always consider the lim inf and the lim sup. And it was shown that the lim inf must always be zero, but the lim sup can be close to one half. And this one half is, is actually sharp, one can show. And to show this, this result about lower density being zero, in 1935, Erdős actually proved the stronger result that the following series of one over n log n for numbers n ranging in a primitive set converges. And he did so, he showed that this series converges uniformly over all choices of primitive sets A. So in this talk, we'll be quite interested in this series, sum of one over n log n for n in a set A, and we'll give it a name, call it f of A. So Erdős showed that f of A, this series, is uniformly bounded over all primitive sets. And later in 1988, Erdős famously asked if this maximum over all primitive sets is actually obtained by the primes. So in other words, the Erdős primitive set conjecture asserts that for any primitive set A, f of A, this sum of one over n log n, is at most f of the primes. So morally, this, this conjecture is essentially saying that using this series f as a statistic, the primes are maximal among all primitive sets. And to make this a little bit more concrete, perhaps, this series f of the primes is nothing more than the series 1 over 2 log 2 plus 1 over 3 log 3 plus 1 over 5 log 5 plus 1 over 7 log 7, et cetera, one term for every prime. And one can show numerically, using Mathematica, for example, that this series comes out to about 1.63666. So in other words, the conjecture is asking whether for every primitive set, the series f of a is at most about 1.6. And throughout the talk, if there are uh, any questions, uh, feel free to, to jump in and just uh, don't hesitate. So some early work on this conjecture uh, was in 1990, first in 1993, due to work of Erdős and Zhang. Uh, mind you, this is a different Zhang uh, at the time. And they showed that f of a was at most 1.84 for all primitive sets a. And more recently, Pomerantz and I improved this result to showing that f of a was at most e to the gamma, which is about 1.781 dot dot dot. And here, uh, gamma is just the euler mascheroni constant, uh, ubiquitous in mathematics. So one might approach this conjecture. It is natural, perhaps, to consider when given an infinite series to just truncate and consider partial sums of this series up to x. However, we know first that the series for the primes, f of, f of the primes, converges quite slowly. So if you look at the series over primes greater than x of 1 over p log p, this contributes about 1 over log x, which is quite slow. And moreover, uh, for each x, there are primitive sets one can construct primitive sets A of X consisting of numbers all larger than X, such that F of A of X tends to one as X tends to infinity. So in other words, this is saying for any potential truncation point X, 
there exists a primitive set A of X whose contribution is all con being uh, aggregated around the tail. So no uh, uniform, well, no uniform. Sorry? Uh, I think there was some I think audio. Glitch. Right. So yes. this is just saying that for any potential uh, uniform uh, threshold cutoff X, there will always exist primitive sets who would fall, whose mass would fall outside the tail. And so this uh, initial approach uh, turns out to be inadequate for the problem. On the other hand, a more fruitful approach towards the Erdős conjecture is actually to split up our set A according to the smallest prime factor of its elements. More specifically, for each prime P, we'll define the subset A sub P consisting of all members N in our set A for which N has smallest prime factor equal to P. So we've now split up our set A into a bunch of A sub P's ranging over primes. Now, as a definition, we can say that a prime P is Erdős strong if the following inequality, f of a sub p, is at most f of p, holding for all primitive sets a. And f of p here is just the singleton, uh, 1 over p log p. So in other words, this definition is saying that the singleton set of just p, just the prime p, is maximal over all primitive a sub p's. So one may think of breaking up the full problem into a bunch of local problems, one for each prime. And indeed, the, con the full conjecture would follow if every prime were known to be Erdős strong. Since in that case, our series of f of a splits as the series f of a sub p for p ranging over primes. And if we knew that every prime were Erdős strong, we'd have a pointwise bound on every f of a sub p by just f of p, giving the full series f of the primes. So this is uh, a natural approach to consider the problem. And in recent work, Pomerantz and I obtained a sufficient condition for a prime to be Erdős strong. But unfortunately, that condition already failed at the first prime, p equals 2, uh, which we found quite disappointing. Uh, however, it did hold for the first 10 to the 8 odd primes. So this gave some. Uh, numerical evidence in, in favor of this uh, approach. And moreover, uh, this condition held for over 99%, not over 99.999973% of primes under a strong form of the Riemann hypothesis, giving further theoretical and conditional support for this approach. On the other hand, one can might view this result uh, perhaps more pessimistically, and indeed, even assuming just the Riemann hypothesis, uh, this result says that a tiny but a positive proportion of primes uh, fail this condition. Specifically, there is a so-called prime number race, in this case, the, involving the Merton's prime product. Um, and even conditionally, one can show that infinitely many primes p uh, are failing this condition. And this perhaps suggests that the Erdős conjecture could be false or at least beyond the reach of unconditional tools. And in addition to contribute more uh, cautionary uh, evidence, it turns out that a translated analog of the Erdős conjecture is false for this, the translated sum f of a comma h, which we define to be the sum of one over n times log n plus h for n ranging on our set. And the original series f of a corresponds to when h is equal to zero. So it would be natural to extend the original conjecture for these translated series. But it turns out there exists a primitive set a for which f of a comma h exceeds f of the primes comma h. And this uh, already occurs for quite small translates h a little bit bigger than one. And hence, the original conjecture, when h is equal to zero, if true, would only barely be so. Jared? Yes. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Sure. Would you want to unmute and ask directly? 
or maybe it's yeah. about uh, what is a strong form of the Riemann hypothesis? Uh, good that? question. So um, for the time I've been suppressing it, but so this involves uh, the Riemann hypothesis uh, as well as the linear independence hypothesis, which, okay, so the Riemann hypothesis says that all the real parts are of non-trivial zeros on line one half, and all the, the linear independence says that the imaginary parts are linearly independent over the rationals. Uh, okay, so that's infinitely beyond the Riemann hypothesis. Yeah, <laughs> but okay. but for brevity, I, I agree, I kind of, as a caricature, I just said strong form, <laughs> but thank yeah. you for the question, yeah. Great. So, yeah, so, so perhaps one might, uh, when presented with this, uh, the, these results, one might have a kind of negative impression of the problem. However, as the main result, I'd like to nevertheless answer Erdős in the affirmative. So that is to say, for any primitive set A, we have that f of A is at most f of the primes. So in other words, using this series f, as some sort of measure of size, some sort of measure of uh, the magnitude, the primes are maximal uh, among all primitive sets. And moreover, using these proof techniques, we were able to show that every odd prime is Erdős strong. So namely for any primitive set A, and in any prime, at least three, we have that f of A sub p is at most f of p. Establishing these kind of local problems for, for odd primes. However, uh, these proof techniques sort of break down, uh, and it remains an open question uh, in the case of the first prime, p equals two, whether or not p equal two is, is strong. And so this is a quite a concrete question, uh, still open, asking whether there exists a primitive set of even numbers whose series f of a is less than one over two log two, f of two. And as often happens in number theory, one can sometimes handle uh, the odd primes uh, separately from the prime, the even prime p equals two. And I guess for some, that reason, some people call it the oddest prime of them all, but this is, this is certainly uh, one of those cases. And in this talk, I'd also like to mention uh, a related question uh, due to Erdős, Sarkozy, and Zamoredi from the 1960s. So in 1968, they were interested in the related question of looking at primitive sets of large numbers. So supposing all primitive, all numbers in your primitive set were at least x, you were, they were interested in asking how large could this series f of a be in the limit as x tends to infinity. And they conjectured partly motivated by some probabilistic uh, heuristics, they believed that this limb soup ranging over primitive sets larger than, uh, primitive sets of numbers larger than X of F of A is at most one. And using the proof techniques uh, from the original conjecture, we're able to make the following progress uh, towards the problem where we show that this Lim soup of f of a, ranging over primitive sets of large numbers, is at most e to the gamma times pi over four. And so numerically, this is about 1.399, about 1.4. And the conjecture is asserting uh, that this limb soup is actually at most one. So, I'd like to give uh, a sketch of some of the ideas that go into the, the proof of these uh, results. And to do so, uh, I'd like to begin with Erdős's original argument from 1935, in which he showed that f of a was uniformly bounded over all primitive sets. Uh, but I'm going to present it in a bit more modern notation than Erdős did. And this will be helpful um, for us going forward. So, in this sketch, we'll show that f of a is at most e to the gamma for all primitive sets. And for simplicity in the sketch, we'll assume that all our elements in a are sufficiently large. And in particular, all the large prime factors are large. 
So let, as some notation, we'll let P of A denote the largest prime factor of our number A. And so our series F of A, which is one over A log A, easily this is uh, at most one over A log P of A. And now once we've done this, we can appeal to Merton's product theorem, which is a classic result uh, already predating the prime number theorem, uh, which says that one over log P of A is roughly e to the gamma times the so-called Merton's product of primes up to P of A of one, mi one minus one over P. And this is uh, useful for us when we're assuming that all our numbers are large, where this rough equality is, is really uh, working for us. So at first glance, this step might seem a bit arbitrary, but the advantage here is that we can now recognize this expression, this, this Merton's product, as representing the natural density of a specific set. Namely, if we introduce the definition L sub A for a number A to be the set of multiples B times A, where all the primes dividing B are at least the largest prime P of A. And indeed, the natural density of this set L sub A contributes a factor of one over A because all the numbers are multiples of A. In addition, there are no small primes P dividing B, which corresponds, this, corresponds to this Merton's product of one minus one over P for all the small primes. And so now uh, what, we've, what we've shown is that at least when all the numbers are large, F of A is at most e to the gamma times the sum of densities of these sets L sub A ranging in our set A. And up till now, I've, I haven't used any properties of the set A at all, but clearly in order to say something about primitive sets, we need to make use of this condition. And in fact, the, the key property that we use is that for a primitive set, these sets of multiples, L sub A, ranging over a set A and A, will be pairwise disjoint. And so this is the key, this is the key uh, property that Erdős needs. And we'll in fact uh, show this in a few slides. But the important consequence for us is that assuming uh, once we know disjointness, this tells us that the sum of densities of LA equals the density of the union of the L sub A's ranging over our set A. So we can give this a name, this union, as L sub capital A is just the union of L sub little a's. So we've shown that essentially our series F of A is at most e to the gamma times the density of our union, L sub A. And finally, the density of any set is at most one. So we conclude an upper bound of e to the gamma, that our series F of A is at most e to the gamma. And this completes the, the sketch, at least, of the proof. And again, in order to make this uh, rigorous, fully rigorous, one needs to consider the case where there are small numbers involved in order and, and use explicit estimates in order to make this uh, fully justified. So this was the overall kind of strategy in, the, in, a, in a, a proof to get some bounds on our series F of A. But in order to make further progress, uh, we identify two crude steps used on the previous slide in Erdős's argument. So the first step is, is the very first one in which we bounded uh, the largest prime factor, P of A, by A itself. And this step clearly can be wasteful. For example, if many elements had small primes, so in other words, suppose we were in the special case where we already knew ahead of time that P of A squared were at most A for all elements in our set. Then in this special case, uh, just going through the argument, once again, on, would automatically give us a savings factor of two and therefore improve the bound to e to the gamma over two. So this numerically is already less than 0.9 and in particular less than F of the primes, which is about 1.6, as we recall. So in other words, in this special case where we had this additional knowledge, we'd get the, the full result. So the other step 
is the final step where we bounded the density of this union L sub A just by one. So this step is a bit more subtle, uh, but one can show that this state can be wasteful if the elements in our set have known multiplicative constraints. So an easy, the, one of the easy examples uh, of such constraints were if our set A contained only odd numbers, in which case uh, one can show that the density of this union L sub A is less than one half. So in other words, in another, in the second special case where there are additional constraints on our set, we can also get a savings factor of two, therefore getting an upper bound of e to the gamma over two, which is less than f of the primes, thereby giving the result in the second case. Uh, so these, are these, these two steps are potentially crude, but we caution and note that for when the set A is the full set of primes themselves, both of these steps are actually perfectly efficient. And indeed, if uh, A is a prime, then it equals its largest prime factor, giving the first step. And one can show that the density of this union of L sub P's is equal to one. So this density statement, this about the second step, is can be viewed as a kind of analytic version of just the basic fact that every positive integer greater than one has a unique smallest prime factor. And so this basic fact, just by unpacking the definition of density and the definition of L sub P gives this, this result. And so uh, you can't get any uh, additional savings when you have the primes, um, but the hope would be that if our set contains some composite numbers, then we could get some savings from one of these two cases. And moreover, one morally should be thinking about, um, I, I've come to, to feel that this, uh, these two potential steps of getting savings are actually explaining why the primes are, should be maximizing our series F of A from the conjecture, because these two steps, you can get no additional savings. So now I'd like to, restrict our attention to uh, sets of composite numbers. And in order to refine this argument of Erdős, we show that if the first step is efficient for a set of composite numbers, then the second step needs to be wasteful, and in which case we'll get savings. So that is to say, if all numbers in our set, A satisfy P of A is approximately the same size of A, then we should be able to get uh, a smaller bound on the density of this union L sub A. And so to make this quantitatively a bit more precise, we have the following uh, proposition. So it says that for any primitive set A and any parameter V satisfying the following inequality, P of A to the one plus V is bigger than A uniformly for all elements on our set. So this is saying that in a quantitative sense that the largest prime factor is quite large. Then we have a bound on the density of our union L sub A by the square root of V. So this bound of the square root of V is refining the trivial bound of one that we used on the, the final step in our sketch at least in the range where our parameter V is between zero and one. And so morally, what this proposition is saying, it says that a primitive set cannot contain too many composite elements, A and A, which have large prime factors, uh, which, which has a very large prime factor, nearly the size of A itself. So, with this key uh, density proposition, one can incorporate it into the original argument of Erdős and get additional savings uh, to get a better bound. So indeed, we've seen from this first step by comparing one over log of A to one over log of P of A, 
in the case of the assumptions of the proposition, this corresponds to a factor of one over one plus V in, the, in this exponent. So we have the savings uh, factor uh, by assumption coming from the first case. And we note that the savings factor is a function which improves as V grows. And therefore, the worst case scenario for us would be when uh, the key density bound of the square root of V held with equality for all V in the range. And thus, one can show that for each V, uh, the subset of A's uh, for which we have an approximate equality holding that P of A to the one plus V is approximately A, this subset would contribute about uh, the derivative uh, of the square root of V, so one over two root V to the density of L sub A. So one should view this morally as saying, if we understand, if we're given a probability distribution, for example, and we have information about the CDF or the cumulative distri uh, distribution function, then we can get information about the, uh, the probability density function just by taking the derivative. And uh, so putting these two pieces together of the savings factor of one over one plus V, along with the density at, at V, the corresponding density of one over two root V, uh, then just by integrating for all V in a range between zero and one, we get our savings. Uh, corresponding to, uh, and in this case, it just comes out to a nice integral of pi over four. So by combining these uh, results all together, the refinement of Erdős's argument leads to the final result that we get a bound of f of a by e to the gamma, as we had before, but now times the savings pi over four. And this is approximately uh, 1.399 numerically, but in particular, it's less than uh, f of the primes, which is about 1.6. And I stress again that um, for the sake of the sketch, we were assuming all the numbers involved were large. And in the latter case, we were assuming we were dealing co with composite numbers. So in order to make this rigorous, one needs to use explicit estimates for small numbers and also uh, take care of a mixed regime between some primes and some composites. But this essential sketch really gives the, the, the flavor of the main ingredients that go in, into this argument, into this bound. So we've seen in this sketch that the subset of multiples L sub A, uh, numbers of the form B times A, where all the primes in B are larger than P of A, this, this object arose naturally in the proof. And here L, uh, alludes to the lexicographical order of numbers uh, by their prime factorization. And so uh, as a definition, we'll say that if a number n is in L sub a, we say n is an L multiple of a, so it's a special kind of multiple, and correspondingly, a will be an L divisor of n. So for example, the L divisors of the number 300, so 300 factors as 2 squared times 3 times 5 squared, would just be given by taking partial products of these primes. So just the first, the empty par product of one, the first prime two, the first two primes four, first three primes 12, and so on. And the next, uh, the first four primes 60, and finally the full product of 300 itself. So in order to get these L divisors, all you have to do is take the, the ascending list of uh, partial products. So once uh, we get a handle on this, this notion of L multiples and L divisors, uh, we observe that there is a very attractive property that they satisfy, namely the, the following trichotomy. So for any numbers a and a prime, any integers at all, either their corresponding multiples L sub a and L sub a prime are pairwise disjoint, or a is in L of a prime, or a prime is in L of a. So in other words, Either one is an L multiple of another, or their, their sets are pairwise disjoint. And in particular, as we recall from the sketch, uh, in the case where A is primitive, you can't have one dividing another, and therefore these sets L sub A need to be pairwise disjoint. And this was the key property that we, we needed. Jared? Yes. Uh, we have a question in the chat, I see sure. you. Hello, Nike. Uh, maybe you just want to unmute and ask why. Uh, so I just wanted to know uh, if A is equal to set of primes. 
Okay. And if I take the V to V uh, in the key lemma, in the three. So, so I, I'm, uh, I was saying that in this uh, sketch, I was restricting my attention to composite numbers. Um, so I, I guess uh, okay. Uh, okay. just just for simplicity, but yeah. yeah thank, thank, thank you for okay. pointing out the uh, that, that fact. Yeah. So this would not hold for the for the primes. The primes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. So we have this following trichotomy. And this was turns gives the the key uh, property that we need to in for in Erdős's argument, and the proof is quite uh, simple. Uh, so the idea is that if uh, you have two numbers and their sets of multiples L sub a and a prime are both uh, disjoint, then we're happy and we're done. So otherwise, we can assume uh, that there's an intersection. So in other words, there are some numbers b and b prime for which b times a is equal to b prime times a prime. And so you can just factor that and write it into primes, p1 up to pr. And so what it means uh, by definition of L sub a and L, L sub a prime, this means that a and a prime are just partial uh, products of primes of the, the small primes. Let's say p1 up to pi for some index i uh, less than r, and a prime is similarly some partial product p1 up to pj. But then you observe, for example, if i is less than j, then a will be a partial product of a prime. In other words, uh, a will be an L divisor of a prime. And similarly, if j is larger, then a prime will be an L divisor of a. And so in, in either case, uh, we conclude uh, the result, and hence we get this trichotomy. And so once we have uh, this notion of L divisibility, uh, we can introduce the following key definition. So we say that a set of positive integers greater than one is L primitive if no member in the set is an L divisor of another. So in particular, when we're looking at L divisors, not, not just any divisor, this uh, definition is weaker than primitive, leading to a broader class of sets. And by the trichotomy that we've seen on the previous slide, this means that A is L primitive if and only if these sets of multiples L sub A are pairwise disjoint. So this gives us a, a nice characterization of this property of L primitive. So uh, it turns out that this trichotomy was the only real property we needed in Erdős's argument. And one can extend this bound uh, to all L primitive sets and show that F of A is less than E to the gamma for all L primitive sets. And moreover, uh, this notion of L primitive sets plays a key role in, in our proof of Erdős's conjecture. And therefore, it's natural perhaps to conjecture that there would be an analog for L primitive sets for which the primes could be a maximizer. However, it turns out that this bound of E to the gamma is best possible in this broader class of L primitive sets. So there are a sequence of L primitive sets, specifically uh, non-primitive L primitive sets, whose series f of a uh, gets arbitrarily close to e to the gamma. Uh, and this, in particular, is larger than f of the primes, which is about 1.6. And hence, this potential L primitive analog of the conjecture uh, is false. And this highlights, perhaps, some of the, the additional subtlety involved in, in the original problem, where Additional information is really crucial. So in the remaining part of the talk, I'd like to give a perhaps a feeling of some of the uh, ingredients that go into the proof of this key density bound. And again, uh, we'll be restricting our attention to sets of composite numbers. Jared, we have another question in the chat. Sure. So it's by Victor Miller. Let's go ahead, Victor. Hi, Jared. Is there right. a nice description of the maximal set for L primitive sets since you say that it's false? I mean, just like you've described the primes, or is it something really complicated? Right. That I mean, that's that's certainly a good question. Um, at least in the counterexample I provide, it was non-constructive. I just proved the existence of these these sets, but yeah, I really don't uh, have a good feeling for what they should look like. But yeah, that, that is certainly a good question. Yeah. 
So in, in this key proposition, I'd like to give a, a feeling of some of the ingredients that go into this. And really at the core of this proof, so, so recall this, this statement says that if we have a set of composite numbers, primitive set of composite numbers with P of A to the one plus V exceeding A for all elements, then we get this stronger bound on the density of our L sub A of the square root of V. And the core of this, the proof of this result uh, is really to construct a larger L primitive set, C, uh, containing A. So CRC will be uh, implicitly uh, dependent on both our given set A, as well as our per given parameter V. And it's important to stress that this set C will not be genuinely primitive, although it will be L primitive. And the, the key part of the proof is to show that our set C is L primitive. And to do so requires the full assumption that our original set A is primitive and not just L primitive. So there's a, a key a, a assumption being used. And for the sake of concreteness, the set C is given by numbers of the form A times C, where A is a number in our set, A, and all the primes dividing C must lie in the following explicit range between P2 of A and P2 of A to the one over square root V. So here, P2 of A is just the second largest prime factor of A. Uh, and again, this is necessarily using assuming that the numbers A are composite. So this is an explicit construction. And the key difficulty is to show that the set C is L primitive. Uh, but there is uh, a natural e easy property just to spot, just by hand, that if we consider when little c is equal to one, we recover that uh, A, our original set, is indeed a subset of, of this larger set C. So uh, assuming this result that we can uh, have a, this new primitive set C, th that is in fact L primitive, not necessarily primitive, then we can actually conclude and get a density bound. So indeed, if we recall, the density of just these, these sets L sub A are given by one over A times the Mernes product, then one can easily show uh, that these sets L sub A and L sub C are self-similar in, in the following precise sense. So the density of L sub C, assuming that our set C is L primitive, allows us to rewrite this density of the union as a sum of densities, which is a key property. And the self-similarity by construction of C tells us that uh, the density of L sub AC is equal to the density of L sub A times this product over primes ranging in our set, uh, uh, ranging in our uh, explicit interval defining our set C of one plus one over P. And um, from this, one can show just by Merton's theorem again, that this product is roughly the log of the larger endpoint divided by the log of the smaller endpoint, which at the end of the day, just comes to about a factor of one over the square root of V. So when the dust settles after performing this computation, we show the relationship that the density of L sub C is approximately the density of L sub A divided by the square root of V. And so if we multiply both sides by the square root of V and use uh, the simple bound that the density of L sub C is at most one, then we can deduce this key bound that the density of L sub A is at most the square root of V, giving the result. So in other words, the moral of this result is saying that we can obtain a stronger bound over the trivial bound on our density by exhibiting uh, extra multiplicative structure lurking explicitly in the form of our set C. So uh, in the remainder of the talk, I might just uh, give uh, some additional applications of some of the ideas uh, that, go, uh, that come from these results. So uh, from an abstract point of view, we can view uh, a primitive set. So recall the definition, no number in the set divides another from a more abstract point of view, this is nothing but an anti-chain 
using the ordering of numbers by divisibility. No number is comparable, or no element is comparable. And so taking the dual notion of a chain where every element is comparable, this gives us uh, the dual object in our context of a, of a divisibility chain. So we have, to be explicit, we have a sequence of numbers d1, d2, d3, et cetera, where each number divides the next in the chain. So these are really the, the natural dual objects to primitive sets. And a classic theorem of Davenport and Erdős from 1937 says that if a set A has positive density, or more specifically, positive upper log density, then our set A must contain an infinite divisibility chain. So this result exemplifies perhaps a, a more general theme in combinatorics, a combinatorial theme in combinatorial number theory out of combinatorics, which says that if a set is large enough, then it must contain structure. So if we recall, um, many, pe many people might be familiar with uh, a result of Zemerady, Zemerady's theorem, which says if a set has positive density, then it must contain arbitrarily long ar arithmetic progressions. So Zemerady's result says that if you have a set being large enough, then it must contain additive structure. And hence, uh, analogously, Davenport and Erdős tell us that if a set is large enough, it must contain multiplicative structure. So in this vein, um, we can analogously introduce uh, notions of L divisibility chains in which uh, a number in the chain, uh, so we have a sequence of numbers, d1, d2, et cetera, where each number is an L divisor of the next in the chain. And in particular, this is a stronger condition than a, uh, a usual divisibility chain. And we can upgrade the davenport erdős theorem to L divisibility chains under the same assumptions. So if a set has positive density, specifically a positive upper log density, then there must exist an infinite L divisibility chain. And one can similarly consider quantitative refinements of davenport erdős uh, quantifying the rate of growth of these divisibility chains. And in the 1960s, uh, Erdős, Sarkozy, and Zemerady had shown that infinitely often, such a divisibility chain, which must exist by Davenport Erdős, must grow infinitely often uh, about size log log y uh, times the density delta divided by e to the gamma. And in this case, for this problem, they were working with log log density, which just recall is the limb soup of one over log log x times this series, one over n log n. And here we already start to see potentially some connections to our series of A. So uh, analogously, uh, using our results, we can uh, extend uh, Erdős, Sarkozy, and Moretti and upgrade it under the same assumptions to get L divisibility chains, getting this stronger structure. And for the sake of time, I uh, only mentioned in passing that uh, it is an open question uh, what these, the optimal uh, rate of growth should be for these problems. Finally, to conclude, uh, I'd like to pose the, uh, an open question. So or what is the maximum of uh, our series f of a over all primitive sets uh, of composite numbers? So this is a natural question. We know in the, the full case of all numbers, uh, we now know uh, the maximal is obtained by the primes. And so what would happen if we threw out the primes and just consider composite numbers? So Banks and Martin uh, had conjectured, uh, uh, still open, that this maximum is obtained by numbers with exactly two prime factors. Perhaps suggesting uh, the following vast generalization in which they conjectured for any integer k and any set of odd primes q. So here we recall that the numbers with exactly k prime factors on q, uh, these k almost primes, are an example of a primitive set. And moreover, they conjecture that for any primitive set of numbers with at least k prime factors all in q, that these uh, subclass of primitive sets should be maximized by the k almost primes q to the k. 
So this really gives uh, a much uh, broader scope to the, the kind of phenomenon uh, hinted at by Erdős's question. So taking a step back for context, to put, put, to put Banks and Martin's question in context, uh, we recall that the definition of a primitive set is quite simple. Uh, no number divides another. And hence, it divide, it, this definition induces a very broad class of sets with potential pathologies, as we, as we recall from Be Besikovich's counterexample. Nevertheless, Banks and Martin are proposing here that the class of primitive sets has structure namely in this hierarchy of maximal elements, q to the k of these k almost primes. So note that uh, Banks and Martin's conjecture holds in the special case of k equals one, since we now know that odd primes are erdős strong. And moreover, assuming their conjecture, one can show that the erdős trakozy zemerady conjecture involving the limb soup of primitive sets of large numbers of f of a actually equals one. So uh, from a broad viewpoint, uh, we can see that their conjecture of Banks and Martin offers a potential framework to unify a lot of the results we've seen uh, in this talk. And with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs>